Adventism. And it's a great uh, honor and privilege for us at ESA to be able to co-sponsor a seminar and event with uh, the French department. And I'm particularly grateful to a member of our faculty advisory committee, Maurice Samuels, who's a professor here in the French department, for helping to uh, coordinate the uh, seminar and, and to put this joint program together. So thank you, Maury. And it's really it's a, an honor to have with us uh, Professor Dorian Bell. Today's lecture is entitled um, A Paradise of Parasites, Hannah Arendt, Anti-Semitism and the Legacy of Empire. Dorian is a, an assistant professor of, in literature, in the literature department at the University of California of Santa Cruz. And he, his research focuses mainly on the histories of race, empire, uh, anti-Semitism in the 19th and 20th century France. Um, he was a postdoc fellow at Stanford's Humanities Fellowship Program in the Department of French and Italian Studies at Stanford University. He did his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania, and as well as a uh, master's degree in comparative literature and literary theory also at the University of Pennsylvania and he did his VA in comparative literature at Cornell University. He's widely written, for, uh, especially for a young scholar. He's in, written in journals from Modern Language Notes to romant the Romantic Review. He has an important book in progress, which is entitled Frontiers of Hate, Anti-Semitism and Empire in 19th Century France, which explores the articulations between anti-Semitism and imperialism, which has shaped the emergence of the European, uh, European racial thought. So, without further ado, I uh, welcome to the floor. So, thank you so much, Charles, for the kind introduction. Um, let me thank Isa as well for the invitation and the Department of French. Um, this is wonderful banner, the name requires a lot of cloth. <laughs> um, I really relish uh, having the opportunity to share my work with what I can already sense is a pretty multidisciplinary group. Uh, my own training, as Charles said, is in comparative literature, but in the project from which I'm drawing this talk, uh, I've increasingly found myself working at the intersection of literature, history, political philosophy, Jewish studies. And as I navigate that intersection, it's helpful to kind of take this work on the road in front of uh, an intellectually and methodologically diverse audience uh, like this. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll really value uh, any feedback I get. Uh, let me just start with a bit of background. Uh, this piece is drawn from my book in progress, about which Charles uh, talked a bit, um, and uh, one of whose primary arguments is that the rise of empire in the late 19th century uh, helped shape the development of modern French and European anti-Semitism in important ways. So just to give you an example, I look at uh, the ways, uh, or look at how the discovery uh, by France and the French anti-Semites of North African Jewry in colonies uh, like Algeria and Tunisia uh, was, uh, it became a real discursive boon to uh, the modern anti-Semitism that was emerging at the same time in the metropole as a bona fide political and ideological force complete with its own newspapers, political parties, uh, and theoretical apparatus. So in the first part of my paper, and the short, short, the shorter part of my paper, I'll be giving an example of this shaping uh, of French anti-Semitism by the North African imperial encounter. In the rest of my paper, I'll be looking beyond the French example to reflect on some of the conceptual and methodological issues raised by this historical articulation between anti-Semitism and empire. The challenge and the opportunity of my project is that there aren't very many existing frames, theoretical um, and, and otherwise, uh, within which to contemplate this articulation. Uh, the, uh, of course, the one big frame that does exist, um, and that's incontrovertible because it's the first, uh, most sustained, and still most important uh, reflection on the articulation uh, between anti-Semitism and empire is, of course, uh, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, so what I want to share with you today in the second and longer part of my paper is the work I've been doing on what I think are some of the conceptual pitfalls that have beset the recent scholarly reception of Arndt's uh, ideas on Jews and empire, as well as to share with you some of the endemic tensions uh, I've identified in Arndt's own thinking on this question and that I think are pervasive enough to warrant changing how we read and how we think about the origins of totalitarianism. Um, so uh, with that prolegomenon out of the way, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, 
Scholars of European anti-Semitism have sometimes been loath to analogize between modern anti-Semitism and colonial racism, often out of concern for maintaining the specificity of the Holocaust. Other critics, most famously Hannah Arendt and the Origins of Totalitarianism, have identified in 19th century racialist imperialism a crucial step along the path to the final solution. Whatever the relative merits of these approaches, even the latter has overlooked, or at least, as we'll see, misapprehended, the extent to which already in the 19th century anti-Semitism and empire were evolving in tandem. The talk that follows makes a double case for the importance of better understanding this co-constitutive relationship. In a brief initial excursion into the history of French anti-Semitism, and taking as my example the late 19th century phantasmatic topos of the Jewish colonial conspirator, I first want to consider how imperial circumstances furnished discursive grist for the mill of an ascendant anti-Semitism in France. Ultimately, however, I'll be most concerned with moving beyond the local particularities of this development to examine how its early articulation together of Jews and empire, along with a similar such articulation a few years later in Britain, has enjoyed a strange and enduring afterlife. Neglect of that afterlife has perpetuated a conceptual blind spot in the recent spate of scholarship inspired by Arendt's suggestion in the origins of totalitarianism that imperialism in Africa set the stage for fascism in Europe, the so-called boomerang thesis. That Arendt, uh, that Arendt conceived such a circulation at all, it was something, I will be arguing, to anti-Semitism's own 19th century inflection by empire, echoing and inverting, as her framework does, the anti-Semitic accusation that Jewish imperial mountain, oh gosh, I oh, knew that was bound to happen. <laughs> so, learning from that lesson. Uh, the anti-Semitic accusation that Jewish imperial malfeasance uh, visited disaster on the metropole. Recognizing this 19th century discursive legacy in the origins of totalitarianism, still the most important critical reflection on the relationship between anti-Semitism and empire, changes how we read the origins, helping correct for unavowed assumptions that structure its arguments. And yet it is also precisely in this shadow content, or rather in the gaps, interstices, and inversions it leaves behind, that emerges what I will propose is a valuable analytic counterpoint to conventional paradigms for thinking anti-Semitism and empire together. So I begin with the French example. France's 1881 invasion of Tunisia, which led to that Ottoman province's de facto colonization as a French protectorate, quickly became the political scandal of the season in Paris. Citing the big speculative interests that stood to gain from the French guarantee of a Tunisian debt actively traded on the Parisian Stock Exchange, the muckraking opposition journalist Henri Rochefort cried foul and accused Prime Minister Jules Ferry and his allies of selling French foreign policy to the highest bidder. Some joining the denunciatory anti-colonial chorus were quick to assume the handiwork of Jewish speculators paving the way for a new and ubiquitous French cultural topos, the Jewish colonial conspirator and profiteer, who would feature prominently in one literary phenomenon, that's Guy de Maupassant's uh, 1885 novel, Belle Amie, uh, a, a host of uh, lesser novels in the 1880s and 90s, and any number of the anti-Semitic newspapers and pamphlets that proliferated in France around this time. Among the chief architects of this vogue was the journalist and agitator Edouard Drummond, Drummond broached the Tunisian affair in his massively influential 1886 anti-Semitic polemic La France Juive, Jewish France, one of the definitive be French bestsellers of the 19th century and the Bible of a national anti-Semitic movement that, with Drummond at its helm, would royal France for the remainder of the century. Drummond's hallucinatory treatise arrived in 1886 in the wake of a series of important colonial developments that contributed to the discovery by metropolitan reactionaries of North African Jewry. The 1870 Cremieux Decree granting French citizenship to indigenous Jews in French colonial Algeria had instantaneously created the most visible Jewish constituency in French history. As a proportion of the population, the 34,000 or so Jews in Algeria far outstripped the 80,000 or so Jews in the much more populous metropole. Suddenly, 10 to 20 percent of the Algerian electorate was Jewish, a proportion that in some towns reached 50 percent. A sharp contrast with France, where Jews represented no more than about 0.02% of the population. Drummond's bugaboo, so demographically insignificant in France, had conveniently assumed a much more impressive form in the colony. Add to this the huge financial scandal surrounding the 1881 invasion of Tunisia, along with the violent anti-Semitic riots in Algeria in 1884, and North Africa was rapidly becoming a particularly contentious theater of French activity. Drummond cannily exploited this theater to maximum rhetorical effect. 
by sensationalizing the imagined crimes of North African Jews and seamlessly linking this construction to existing misgivings about the role of metropolitan French Jews in the colonial project, Drummond located in the imperial frontier a potent discursive frontier for his aggressive new brand of anti-Semitism. Drummond was especially adept at deploying colonial events to offer comparative proof, I put that in quotation marks obviously, that Jewish financial and political maneuvers were common to and coordinated across different Jewish communities sharing the same racial bond. The 1881 Tunisian invasion proved particularly useful in this racializing endeavor, as did the Crémieux Decree, both of which received uh, considerable attention from Drummond and La France Juive, but for, for the sake of time, I'll limit my comments here to the Tunisian invasion. Dogged by rumors that had been prompted by backroom investment schemes, the invasion had provoked outrage over tales of political and financial skullduggery by both Metropolitan and Tunisian Jews. Drummond's contribution was to insist on the coordination of these two Jewries in the affair. Drummond charged that Madame Elias Musali, a central Tunisian figure in the scandal, whom Drummond inaccurately labeled a Jew, by the way, uh, but for his purposes, since she was, she was Jewish, um, had conspired from across the Mediterranean to harness the financial and political wherewithal of her metropolitan brethren. This is uh, Elias Musali. In this fashion, Drummond could suggest that Jews were everywhere the same, regardless of geography or culture, and that what made them the same was an innate predilection for conspiracy and financial villainy. This villainy was made handily corporeal and, by extension, racial by Drummond's newly historicized redeployment of otherwise hackneyed Orientalist descriptions, descriptions to which he affixed signification they did not yet completely possess. Of Elias Musadi, Drummond writes the following. You often notice in travel books those African Jewesses half lolling on cushions at the back of a secluded room in their home, resting their ring-laden fingers on a vast flabby belly. Overcome by stoutness at 30 years of age, glistening with fat, they have but one remaining passion, to watch grow the heavy sequin necklace around their bloated necks. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on and on. I'm going to spare you most of it. But, uh, it was with one of these Jewesses, Madame Elias Moussadi, that Roustan, as the French consul in Tunisia at the time, decided that it was necessary to kill a certain number of our poor soldiers. So that's Drummond and the Tunisian affair. As Drummond himself underlines with his reference to travel books, little about this venomous portrait was likely on the surface to strike the reader as new. The textual and iconographic inheritance of, an or of Orientalism had conditioned the French, when they were not being regaled by stories of the <coughs> Oriental Jewess's incomparable beauty, to think of her as the epitome of gluttony. As several commentators have observed, however, the 19th century French Orientalist tradition had typically abstracted the object of its exoticizing fantasies from the material and political realities surrounding the Occident's ever-increasing imperial penetration of North Africa and the Middle and Far East. Puncturing this aestheticizing auto-referentiality, Drummond made the Oriental Jew, in the person of Elias Moussali, in the example I gave you, step menacingly from the quaint Orientalist tableau and into the actual financial and political life of the metropole. That Drummond's Tunisian conspiracy theory both emerged and departed from received Orientalist practice, drawing on stock Orientalist representations of North African Jewry, yet overtly politicizing them to an unprecedented degree, poses a useful first test to established modes of thinking anti-Semitism uh, and empire together. As my terminology indicates, one of the few such ready theoretical frames can be located, and has been located, in the work of Edward Said, which I want to invoke quickly less on its own terms than for what it helps reveal about an ongoing blind spot in the reception of another such theoretical frame, namely the reflection on anti-Semitism and empire that traverses Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, to which I'll be turning the bulk of my remaining attention. If I call Said's project a ready frame for tracing articulations between anti-Semitism and empire, it's in part because he himself invited that effort, going so far as to observe that in writing the history of Orientalism, he was, quote, writing the history of a strange secret share of Western anti-Semitism, end quote. What he's referencing, of course, is that the 19th century philological racism popularized by the likes of Ernest Renan included the Jew and the Muslim in the larger taxonomic category of the sensuous, indolent, and fanatical Semite who had supposedly been theologically and culturally superseded by the Aryan Christian. Denunciations of Jews now could increasingly draw on the same wellspring of pseudo-scientific fictions that nourished 
orientalizing representations of Muslims deployed in conjunction with and legitimation of imperial conquest. Jews, to be sure, did not control the overseas lands targeted for European domination in the 19th century, which helps account for why Said, concerned as he was with questions of colonial empire, limited himself to describing what he called the Islamic branch of Orientalism. Scholars have since begun sketching what might correspondingly be designated as Orientalism's Jewish branch, remaining within a Saidian paradigm to argue, notably in the case of 18th and 19th century Germany, that orientalizing discourses about European Jews accompanied attempts to subject them to an inner European colonialism, as, as one uh, scholar puts it, bearing an ideological kinship with colonial expansion further afield. Historical specifics aside, what I want to emphasize is the supposition underpinning most comparisons between internal and external colonialisms, or between discourses <coughs> about Jews and Muslims. These schemas generally posit ways in which practices and discourses aimed at Jews and imperial subalterns shared a common basis. For Said, philological racism constituted one such basis, offering as it did a combined store of historical and cultural fallacies with which to tar Europe's internal Jewish enemy and external Muslim foe alike. Others have thought more longitudinally, for instance, locating in Christianity's theological appropriation and expurgation of Judaism, a proto-imperialist template for later patterns of colonial conquest and eradication. Either way, a basic logic remains, one that equates the Jew and the colonized as dual victims of the same insidious race thinking. I borrow the, the term race thinking from Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Arendt, too, subscribed to a genealogical logic according to which various 19th century racisms, and by this she means full-fledged ideologies like colonial racism, emerged from a European race thinking traceable to the Enlightenment and refined in the 19th century by thinkers like Arthur Le Bobineau. When combined with different political exigencies, Arendt argues, this race thinking lent itself to various manifestations of focused racism. So, for instance, did colonial racism serve the requirements of empire, or anti-Semitism serve the requirements of political reactions fixated on the Jews? Various European racisms might function differently and target different groups, but they all proceeded from common epistemic ground. This genealogical demonstration by Arendt carries an unspoken and overlooked corollary critical to the rest of the origins of totalitarianism. And that's a mutual intelligibility between racisms owing to their common epistemic source that by implication made it easy for them to reinforce each other. Much has been made in recent years of the boomerang thesis developed by Arendt in The Origins, in which he suggests that a bureaucratically administered racism honed in the 19th and early 20th century imperial periphery rebounded onto the European continent and achieved its purest expression in, in the Nazi exterminationist project. Searching, as she wrote The Origins in the late 1940s to explain the totalitarian tragedy that had just engulfed Europe, Arendt seized, among other factors, on the European scramble for Africa in the late 19th century and the role she felt it had played in unleashing the hitherto latent potential for race thinking to destroy the European body politic. Commentators have long observed that Arendt remains vague about the actual mechanisms whereby imperial sins came home to roost and that a central premise of her boomerang thesis, the destruction of the nation state by imperialism, has difficulty withstanding scrutiny. Those intrigued by Arendt's argument have tried, with varying results, to locate tangible historical pathways through which imperial racism might have carried back onto Europe. Indeed, this elaborating project has become a cornerstone of the burgeoning field of comparative genocide studies. But what has perhaps gone insufficiently recognized is that the genealogical dimension to Arendt's thought on racism meant that her boomerang thesis never required for its explanatory thrust the existence of especially concrete channels funneling bureaucratic imperial racism toward the continent. If various continental and imperial racisms shared a common origin in race thinking, then it was expected enough that they should easy and easily interrelate, like the separated branches of a river joining again with new torrential force. So conceived, racisms did not need much to catalyze their interaction. Thus can Arendt propose, for example, that the mere example of the race society fashioned by the Boers in South Africa bolstered Nazi confidence in the principle of a master race. Arendt might have noted the imbrication of racist and expansionist German discourses about Central European Slavs and Jews and Central Afri African blacks as far back as Kaiser Wilhelm. But she didn't need to, at least according to the parameters of her approach. 
Once the deep homology between racisms established, it became somewhat redundant to parse various causeways between phenomena that already, in their very essence, lent themselves to almost inevitable reciprocity. Now, Arendt herself would likely object to this characterization of her thinking, uh, teetering as it does on the brink of the historical determinism she, she so vocally eschewed. She made a special point to reject any linear narrativizing account of totalitarianism as the inevitable last link in a chain of historical causalities. Responding to the political philosopher Eric Vogelin, who interpreted the origins as, quote, a gradual revelation of the essence of totalitarianism from its inchoate forms in the 18th century to the fully developed, end quote, Arendt countered that no such inchoate originary essence had ever existed. Her intention, she continued, had been to, quote, talk only of elements which eventually crystallize into totalitarianism, some of which are traceable to the 18th century, some perhaps even farther back. Arendt's point is that the crystallization of these elements into totalitarianism remained contingent, even if the ind individual elements themselves might possess genealogical precursors. But maintaining this distinction between the synchronic contingent figure of crystallization and the more diachronic determining figure of genealogy proved easier said than done. The origins finds Arendt slipping between the two and never more than in her disquisitions on race. For if imperial racism in Africa was for Arendt one of the elements that crystallized with continental imperial racism, such as what she called pan-Germanism, to produce totalitarian racism, this crystallization together of racisms was implicitly facilitated by the close genealogical kinship the various racisms already share. So much so that, as I've already observed, Arendt hardly bothers looking for any actual discursive or material nuclei, excuse me, nuclei around which the crystallization might have proceeded. Crystallization, in other words, here swaps much of its contingency for the necessity of genealogy. <coughs> Critics have certainly noted the tension throughout the origins between what Sela Ben Habib calls Arendt's fragmentary historiography of crystallization and a more traditionally linear genealogical search for origins. Yet there is still more specific work to be done, I think, to recognize and account for the interwoven logics of contingency and genealogy in Arendt's thesis of boomeranging racism. One might begin by asking whether the recent and increasingly numerous efforts to give Arendt's thesis a sounder evidential basis to follow up on Arendt's intuition, as a recent volume put it, may actually fall somewhat beside the point, at least insofar as that basis seems often to consist of identifying institutional or other pathways along which the boomerang ostensibly traveled from Africa to Europe. If, as Arendt implicitly allows, the crystallization of African and continental imperial racisms into totalitarian racism was expedited by their common parentage in a European race thinking, then the existence of identifiable causal pathways between the various racisms uh, becomes less important than the far more diffuse attainment of a saturation point. Like a crystal forming spontaneously in a concentrated solution, totalitarian racism coalesced for Arendt after colonial empire massively injected the European zeitgeist with the applied possibilities of a race thinking that already suffused the continent. Charting the attainment of such a saturation point in anything but the vaguest terms represents a challenging goal indeed. But perhaps an even greater challenge to, to substantiating Arendt's boomerang thesis is that the heuristics of genealogy and contingency do more than just intersect. They also subtly interfere. Presuming the common genealogical origin in race thinking of imperial and totalitarian racisms has the effect of equating their chief respective targets, the colonized abroad and the Jews back home, as successive victims of two outshoots of race thinking that naturally resonated, resonated excuse me, together. The notion is intuitive enough. Many of an observer besides Arendt has similarly conceived the relationship between anti-Semitism and imperial racism as that of one racism chasing another, um, in the words of uh, Marc Angenau, uh, characterized by what another critic calls relations of mutual support, or uh, uh, even another critic calls interrelated inflections. One can include Said here as well, for whom anti-Semitism and Orientalist imperialism drew on the same phylogical phantasms about Semites. The problem with such genealogical thinking is that it obscures how the rise of empire might have contributed to the rise of modern anti-Semitism in ways unrelated to the direct exercise of imperial racism. That is to say, in more unpredictably contingent ways not overdetermined by a common genealogy of race thinking. Consider the phenomenon I documented before. 
which is the myth propagated by late 19th century French anti-Semites that Jewish interests in France were instigating French colonial interventions uh, in North Africa for their own gain. There's no doubt this successful anti-Semitic narrative bore some genealogical relation to the imperial racism that helped legitimate colonial expansion. After all, the topos of the Jewish colonial conspirator derived must, much of its shock value from the image of metropolitan Jews conniving with their more alien and therefore more easily racializable indigenous Jewish counterparts in colonies like Tunisia and Algeria. But the fact also remains that many of these anti-Semites, Trimont among them, were at first opposed to French colonial expansion, and thus that their articulation together of the imperial and Jewish questions owed as much or even more to the fact of empire itself than to its status as a racist enterprise. In other words, there's a great deal about this co-constructedness of anti-Semitism and empire that, as the product of historically specific and contingent circumstances, remains uncoupled from any common parentage between discourses about Jews and Muslims. This has received little attention, however, because of the genealogical reflex that conceives the relation between empire and anti-Semitism as the logical transfer from the colonized to to the Jews, or vice versa, of a racial animus evolving over time. Further reinforcing the genealogical metonymic narrative of a European racialism fastening sequentially onto one victim after another is the massive telos furnished by the Holocaust. Indeed, Arendt's boomerang thesis owes much of its abiding influence to the historicizing explanation it offers for the exterminationist Nazi campaign against European Jewry. Arendt's, uh, Arendt postulates a new category of superfluous man, as she calls it, jarred loose by the 19th century dislocations of capital and empire. A category as emergent in the superfluous European masses consigned to the imperial periphery as in the colonized masses relegated by racism to the margins of human endeavor. All of this reaches its culminating expression in the absolute superfluousness of the concentration camp victim, rendered infinitely expendable because, as Arendt puts it, he has been banished from the human world altogether. Surging forth from Europe, then gaining potency in Africa before returning to the, con to the continent with a vengeance, superfluousness offers Arendt a conceptual pivot around which to portray the Jews as the final and arguably most quintessential victims of empire. Yet what this lasting boomerang imagery has tended to obscure is that for Arendt, European Jews were not just the final repository of the superfluousness set in motion by empire. They were also among the very first. With the late 19th century rise of colonial empire, Arendt offers, Europe's ascendant bourgeoisie saw its first opportunity to profit from state enterprise. The resultant flow of bourgeois capital into the imperial project dislodged the Jews from their traditional privileged role as bankers to the state. This is Arendt's argument. And her conclusion about the outcome is profound. Jewish wealth no longer explainable as the consequence of a tangible and potentially still justifiable financial service rendered to the nation state, the Jew could now be portrayed more convincingly than ever as the social parasite par excellence. Arendt, in other words, credits the rise of empire with the late 19th century European emergence of a modern anti-Semitism that by categorizing the Jews en masse as socially superfluous, prefigured a 20th century totalitarian exterminationism radically intent on demonstrating the Jews' corresponding expendability. In Arendt's account, then, empire twice renders the Jews superfluous. The first time when the bourgeois project of empire ended the longtime symbiosis between European nation states and Jewish finance, and the second time when the concentration camps made Jews the final and most abject category of what she calls superfluous man, incarnated in Africa by colonizers and the colonized. The two processes are related with the earlier attribution to the Jews of superfluousness setting the stage for a later attempt at eradication. But a fundamental difference also remains. Arendt's thesis of a bureaucratized colonial racism coming home to roost in the Holocaust groups Jews and the colonized on the receiving end of a single, if evolving, pattern of European racist domination. Her notion of a perceived Jewish superfluousness in the initial wake of the scramble for Africa, however, posits a more historically contingent relationship between anti-Semitism and empire. If the promise of overseas riches prompted bourgeois investors to displace the Jews as financiers to the state, this had little to do with imperial racism, at least as regards the Jews. 
The same pretext for anti-Semitism would ostensibly have emerged had the bourgeoisie found any other reason to overcome its traditional disinterest in state-backed commerce, or had the Jews themselves simply decided to withhold their capital from governments. Next to Arendt's more readily visualizable narrative tracing a rebound onto Europe of imperial misdeeds, her comparatively abstract correlation of modern anti-Semitism with the diminishment of Jewish influence in the Age of Empire has generated less commentary. For one thing, it confounds the genealogical reflex that conceives European Jewry as a variety of the colonized. For another, it attends to the prehistory of the, of the Holocaust, rather than the Holocaust itself, a peripherality compounded by the difficulty of connecting Nazi exterminationism to the modern anti-Semitism Arendt attributes to a scramble for Africa in which England and France played far greater roles than Germany. Yet Arendt's claim of a Jewish superfluousness born first of the imperial fact and only later reinforced by boomeranging imperial racism, offers important insight not only to the actual historical articulation between anti-Semitism and empire, but also into what I will be arguing is her own problematic indebtedness to the late 19th and early 20th century discourses this articulation produced. I turn now to that indebtedness and to how Arendt's uneven efforts to transcend it structure and delimit her argument in critical ways. Charting this hidden fault line in the origins begins with recognizing that Arendt was both right and wrong in her description of how imperial circumstances other than racism shaped the development of modern anti-Semitism. Right because modern anti-Semitism and empire indeed co-evolved in ways not always reducible to their shared basis in race thinking. Wrong because the historical record suggests that the rise of empire hardly led to the perception that Jews had lost their privileged relationship to the state and now only exhibited, as she puts it, a parasitic wealth without visible function. On the contrary, a series of rapid-fire, unpopular colonial adventures by France and England after 1870 emboldened many in those countries to argue that Jews were more shamelessly pulling the levers of state power than ever. It doesn't matter that this perceived Jewish influence was obviously understood to function toward nefarious ends. What matters is that it was understood <coughs> to function at all. Citing Tocqueville's contention that the French revolutionary masses most hated the aristocracy once its waning state privileges no longer seem to justify its continued wealth, whether or not the masses have perceived those privileges as fair, Arendt argues that Jews likewise attracted universal hatred, and that's her term, <clears throat> when empire cost them influence in a way that made their wealth seem inexplicable. Yet given the success with which Jews were supposedly manipulating the state imperial project to their profit, Jewish wealth had, if anything, become more explicable, though, of course, only spuriously. Hence could French anti-Semites, for example, argue with seductive specificity that France's 1881 invasion of Tunisia had been ordered by Jewish holders of Tunisian debt. British anti-Semites, deploying an essentially analogous tactic, would for their part argue that Jewish diamond and gold interests in the South African Rand had in 1899 embroiled Britain in the bloody Second Boer War. Evidently, empire offered tempting fodder for a newly politicized brand of European anti-Semitism. And as Arendt was the first to understand, this early encounter between two great hydras of modernity produced discourses that empire, as a comprehensive political phenomenon and not just a racist ideology, allowed to flourish about Jews. But Arendt otherwise reads the effect of empire and anti-Semitism against the grain. Rather than exploring how imperial adventures furnished grist for accusations of Jewish collusion with governments, she proposes the opposite, namely that empire bred anti-Semitism anti by making Jews seem superfluous to state affairs. What accounts for this oppositional choice by Arendt, once so symmetrical in its inversion of early anti-Semitic arguments about empire, as to seem almost willful? The answer I want to propose concerns the fact that Arendt herself partially reprised the old anti-Semitic canard that Jewish finance greased the wheels of European imperialism. And helps illustrate what I'll be arguing is the invisible conceptual freight carried for Arendt by the theme of superfluousness that so animates the origins. Arendt's multiple invocations of the celebrated British economist J.A. Hobson, author of the 1902 anti-colonialist study Imperialism, are telling in this regard. Like Lenin before her, Arendt accepted Hobson's central thesis that imperialism was driven by the need of superfluous European capital to ceaselessly press farther afield in the search for new markets and investments. Building on Hobson's notion, as well as on Rosa Luxemburg's related critique of imperialism as the inevitable political corollary of accumulated capital, 
Arendt portrayed superfluousness as both the engine and self-reproducing outcome of empire. Empire channeled abroad the superfluous labor and wealth generated by capitalism. It expropriated the resources of others to produce further superfluous wealth. And finally, having institutionalized the superfluousness of its agents and victims, it added European Jewry to the disposable ranks of superfluous man. Driving all this for Arendt was a bourgeoisie enthralled with making money beget money, an obsession that in its imperial configuration as what she called expansion for expansion's sake, she felt had upended the principles of the nation state and set Europe on the path to totalitarianism and extermina exterminationist anti-Semitism. But Arendt did not just count the Jews among the victims of a ravaging imperial superfluousness. She argued as well that they helped to unleash it. Arendt submits that it was European Jewish financiers who opened the channels of capital export to superfluous wealth by facilitating government investment abroad during the initial phase of imperialism in the 1870s and 80s. In support of her claim, she cites Hobson, whose early critiques of imperialism contained choice words about the Jewish role in colonial South Africa. Endorsing Hobson as, quote, very reliable in, in observation and very honest in analysis, end quote, Arendt reproduces at length a passage from a 1900 article Hobson penned whose tenor speaks for itself. Jewish financiers, Hobson reports, went to South Africa, and I'm quoting him here from, uh, actually this is Arendt, Arendt uh, quoting him in, in The Origins. Jewish financiers went to South Africa, quote, for money, and those who came early and made most have commonly withdrawn their persons, leaving their economic fangs in the carcass of their prey. They fastened on the rand as they were prepared to fasten upon any other spot upon the globe. Now that's Arendt happily quoting Hobson. In a passage of the article not cited by Arendt, Hobson labels these Jewish financiers the, quote, primary cause of the present trouble in South Africa. Uh, end quote. Because they stood to gain economically from British imperial intervention. I'm sorry, economically from British imperial intervention. Hobson's impassioned book length denunciation of the Second Boer War, uh, it's called the War in South Africa, its causes and effects from 1900. Likewise, features Jews prominently on the causes side, the side of the ledger. To the question posed by one chapter title, For Whom Are We Fighting?, Hobson offers a familiar response the Jewish diamond and gold magnates, for, who have transformed Johannesburg into a quote-unquote new Jerusalem on the helpless swatch of what he calls the quote, slower-witted Britain. Arendt's queasy ventriloquizing of Hobson figures centrally in Bernard Wasserstein's controversial recent harangue against Arendt and the Times Literary Supplement, in which Wasserstein charges Arendt with having internalized the anti-Semitism of the authorities she cited and that Hobson uh, passage is, is one that he, that he uh, cites. Though the evidence is new, the polemic is not, dating as it does to the furor that greeted Arendt's contentions in Eichmann and Jerusalem about Jewish cooperation uh, with the Holocaust. Whatever complexities Arendt's use of Hobson might or might not indicate about her relationship to her own Jewishness, however, I find it more analytically productive to contemplate what it reveals about Arendt's argument in the origins of totalitarianism. And what it reveals, I think, is a thinker grappling intensely with her indebtedness to a certain epistemic paradigm. Shocking as it is for Arendt blithely to recycle Hobson's tale of the empirical Jews, or for that matter, to borrow approvingly an account by Hobson's contemporary J.A. Froud of Jewish merchants in South Africa, quote, gathered like eagles over their prey, and that's another one that she happily cites in the origins. Uh, Arendt does this with calculated intent. Her praise for Hobson's supposed reliability is mostly designed to demonstrate that if in imperialism, Hobson, and that's the, 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 the Hobson uh, book, Imperialism, Hobson no longer blamed the Jews for the Second Boer War, it was because he had since correctly and honestly recognized that, as she puts it, quote, their influence and role had been temporary and somewhat superficial, <coughs> end quote. Arendt means to illustrate that despite an initial role as financial facilitators, Jews were eventually wholly supplanted in their imperial function by the bourgeoisie. Jews were, quote, only the representatives, not the owners of the superfluous capital, she writes. It follows that the Jews themselves were easily made superfluous by empire. 
something to which, as we have seen, Arendt attributes the rise of modern anti-Semitism. Notice here the inversion accomplished by Arendt. Hobson at one point considered Jews responsible for the imperial developments he decried. But Arendt takes Hobson's later silence on the matter as more than just evidence that Jews had not, in fact, played a determining role in South African affairs. Rather, she reverses the terms of the equation altogether. Whereas Hobson and others blamed Jewish influence for the rise of empire, Arendt locates in the rise of empire the beginning of a perilous Jewish irrelevance. In other words, Arendt maintains the old causal link between empire and the Jewish question, even if she reverses its polarity. Arendt is in many ways clearly writing against Hobson. She explicitly rebukes him for suggesting that the Rothschilds, the international Jewish banking family, and eternal bugaboo of anti-Semites pulled the strings of every European war. More subtly, her argument about the Jews' reluctance to translate economic influence in South Africa into political influence represents an implicit rebuttal to Hobson's own contention that Jewish businessmen had in South Africa made an exception to their usual disinterest in political matters. Yet Arendt is also unmistakably writing within a long discursive tradition of linking the Jewish and imperial questions, a tradition shaped by anti-Semites who, beginning in the late 19th century, saw in the passions stirred by empire a chance to stoke hatred against Jews. This tradition, I want to argue, supplied the epistemic grounds, indeed the condition of possibility, for Arendt to think Jews and empire together. One finds it difficult to imagine that Arendt would otherwise have formulated so circumstantial an explanation for modern anti-Semitism as the relative non-participation by Jews and empire, given that the terms of her argument would seem inherently to militate against conceiving any relationship between Jews and empire in the first place. That her thesis so symmetrically inverts existing assumptions about Jews and empire only underscores her dependence on so improbable a conceptual forebear. Critics have sometimes charged, and rightfully, I think, that Arendt's representation of black Africans in the origins doesn't always rise above the racialist imperialism she assails. So too, I would add now, does Arendt strain mightily against the anti-Semitic inheritance that subtly structures one of her core claims about the implications of empire for Jews. From this perspective, Arendt's unsettlingly, unsettlingly approving reproduction of Hobson's anti-Semitic invective might be considered symptomatic, a stray artifact of her reliance on and only partial reconfiguration of an existing discourse. There is, of course, also the matter of Arendt's ever contentious insistence on the Jewish portion of responsibility for anti-Semitism, which occasioned her somewhat perverse readiness to consider anti-Semitic sources reliable. At least when it comes to her indulgence of Hobson's dubious remarks about Jews in South Africa, however, I would suggest that the picture is rather more complex, and that Arendt's micro-appropriation here of anti-Semitic language actually finds her trying to exercise her macro dependence on an anti-Semitic discourse about empire. By deploying familiar topoi from the anti-Semitic lexicon in her depiction of an imperial South Africa afflicted by gold lust, economic predation, and financial parasitism, Arendt lays the groundwork for reapportioning blame to a variety of other imperial actors, all of whom, Arendt means clearly to suggest, behaved more Jewishly than the Jews themselves. Thus, for instance, does Arendt memorably dub the colonial South Africa the first paradise of parasites because it channeled superfluous capital and labor into the ne plus ultra of bourgeois fantasies, directly transforming money into more money by literally mining it from the earth. Arendt's inclusion of, Jer of Jews among these parasites, though only as temporary avatars and middlemen of the real bourgeois owners of parasitic wealth, possesses the rhetorical advantage of acknowledging, rather than alighting, the historical fact of Jewish involvement in the South African gold and diamond mines. But Arendt also willfully plays up the parasitism of these Jews, the better, the better to transfer its stigma onto their bourgeois patrons, and to rehearse, by the same token, her own substitution of the bourgeois for the Jew in the old anti-Semitic narrative about empire that she has only partially recast. Thus, too, does Arendt draw unlikely correspondences between Jews and the Boers of turn-of-the-century South Africa. Like the Jews, she remarks, the Boers, quote, firmly believed in themselves as the chosen people, end quote. 
and if the Boers were the most virulent in their anti-Semitism, it was because they identified in the Jews a competing claim to chosenness, as she puts it. Arendt's analogy foreshadows her later argument that supranational racist movements in Europe shared an affinity with and even patterned themselves after what she calls the rootlessness and tribalness of the Jews. Yet it serves as well in the manner I have been describing to offload onto others the structural role played by Jews in the anti-Semitic narrative about empire that Arendt inherits and reconfigures. The Boers are like Jews for Arendt because on a certain level she requires them to function as Jews something that perhaps explains why, in citing the Boers, quote, complete lack of literature and other intellectual achievement, Arendt echoes a classic slur directed by anti-Semites at the Jewish people. Arendt, in short, seeks to make Jews as redundant as possible to the economy of imperial superfluousness, she theorizes. What becomes, then, of those superfluous to superfluousness itself? Like the negative of a negative, they revert to a positive, at least in the South African context. Arendt reports that after having been displaced from their earlier speculative activities, South African Jews became an island of normalcy and productivity in the gold-distorted imperial economy by becoming manufacturers, shopkeepers, and members of the liberal professions. This only earned them more hatred from the Boers, Arendt adds, because they were now antithetical in their very productivity to the parasitic economy of superfluousness predicated on the racist spoliation of labor and mineral wealth. The irony is, of course, superb and quite intentional on Arendt's part. Here is a group of non-Jews become more stereotypically Jewish than the Jews themselves, and hating their real Jewish neighbors for not engaging in predatory economic activity. With this wry series of inversions, Arendt completes her transfer away from the Jews of the Jewish function in the old anti-Semitic critique of empire, whose basic conceptual armature she otherwise maintains. Arendt's correlation of Boer anti-Semitism with the displacement of Jews from the financial machinery of empire recalls her larger thesis about European anti-Semitism, which she likewise correlates with the ultimate absence of Jews from the imperial state project. <coughs> Still, the mechanisms she invokes to explain these two correlations suspicion of Jewish productivity in the South African case and suspicion of Jewish non-productivity in the European case prove difficult to reconcile. The fact that Arendt's core notion about the superfluousness of Jews to the project of empire survives these varied and contradictory applications bespeaks less, I think, an analytic confusion than a steady projection by Arendt into her arguments of her own conceptual preoccupation namely the preoccupation to render the Jews superfluous to a theory of empire problematically descended from a bygone narrative of Jewish colonial conspiracy. The paradoxical result is that this first and most famous attempt to link anti-Semitism and imperialism is simultaneously at pains in many ways to cleave the Jew from the story of empire. That imperative exacts a price, for instance, in Arendt's patently uh, inaccurate claim that the substantial population of indigenous Jews in French colonial Algeria didn't play much of a role in French imperial politics, uh, counterexamples to which are beginning to fill whole books, including the one I'm uh, at work on. Here I would cite Said as well, who, as I mentioned before, gestured tantalizingly toward the reciprocity of anti-Semitism and empire by characterizing Orientalism as the secret sharer of Western anti-Semitism. Like the captain and stowaway of the Conrad story, however, Said's secret sharers ultimately part ways. Cleveland did too for Said when, as he puts it, the Semitic myth bifurcated in the Zionist movement. One Semite went the way of Orientalism, the other, the Arab, uh, was forced to go the way of the Oriental. Said's too neat distinction between colonizing Jews and colonized Arabs like Arendt's reductive differentiation between bourgeois imperialists and Jewish bystanders, elides the historical fact that, more than any other group, Jews were everywhere made to straddle the imperial divide. At once colonizer and colonized, European and Arab, assimilated middleman and scapegoated pariah. The task at hand is better to appreciate how the complex dynamics of this oscillation inflected anti-Semitism in the era of empire. Thanks. Thank you very much for a, a rich, in-depth uh, paper, and we'll have a Q&A session now.
Yeah, I can. I have a thank you for that. I mean, it was very. Uh, you know, I've read parts of it, but it was. It was really. I, I can really see how it's coming together in really interesting ways. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, one sort of factual one, and then uh, and one kind of more, you know, uh, speculative. But I guess I've just never fully understood what aren't means. I mean, like, what she's talking about exactly with um, how, how Jewish bankers become super, superfluous in the 19th century, it seems counter to everything I know. I mean, this is the age when, in fact, Jewish bankers are, are you know, exerting lots of power. And, and what, is it, what does that mean about, you know, so I guess she's sort of opposing that to this uh, concept of this, the court Jew you know, in the 18th century, but why was that less superfluous somehow? I've just never fully understood that. So that's, if you can explain that, and then, uh, well, all right, then I'll ask you my other question. Sure. Um, well, I mean, the, you know, the, the answer that I've given here is that she's wrong, so I agree, <laughs> okay. I, I agree with but you where is in that she respect, but, the, but the, yeah. the explanation for it yeah. is what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here in this, yeah. in this work. Uh, which is that uh, she, she, she inherits this linkage between Jews and empire um, from anti-Semites who were uh, utterly convinced that Jews were more than ever uh, in charge of governments, and particularly in, in France. Mm -hmm. And so my argument is that it's a you know, psychically prob problematic inheritance that she's trying to work through. Right. And, um, that, I, I think, accounts for a lot, a lot of the, these tensions and the origins. And one of the things I think accounts for is this this wholesale invention of the superfluous of the Jews, superflu superfluousness of the Jews, uh, starting in the late 19th century, um, which I, I really I think is in some ways more of a, a projection into her argument on her part of her own preoccupation with exercising this this uh, this inheritance from her thinking, right? And so it's 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 a, you know the, the the fact that she needs to make Jews superfluous to this story of empire that she's inherited right. ends up manifesting itself kind of symptomatically in the argument itself as the superfluousness of the Jews. I mean, the, the, right. the kind of superfluousness that uh, Maury's talking about here is the superfluous produced by empire itself that displaces uh, Jewish financiers to the state who traditionally had had played this, this role, first of court Jews and then later in, uh, of financiers um, in favor of uh, a rising bourgeoisie that for the first time is willing to take part in uh, state commerce and the state practice of empire and that, that leaves Jews without the, the same sort of identifiable role that they'd had before. But, uh, you know, the, the, the historical evidence, and I mean, I'm, you know, what I'm pointing to here is, is arguments uh, mobilized by anti-Semites themselves, it seemed to indicate that, if anything, this convinced people <laughs> all the more that Jews were calling the shots. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the reasons that I, you know, I argue that in, in this project that the rise of empire contributes to uh, the, the rise of modern anti-Semitism, certainly to its ideological elaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the first question. Okay, second question is just uh, if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on this idea of inner European colonization. Uh, you know, you, you sort of raise that, but don't really come down on any side. I mean, do you think that we can talk about uh, Jews, European Jews, as having been colonized, in a sense, by a kind of Western mentality? What, and what would that imply? You know, there, you know, arguments have been made, um, uh, like I mentioned, in particular in the, in the, in the German uh, context, um, where scholars have, have you know, pointed to, to texts in which um, you know, the, 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 this thorny question of uh, the Jewish question of Jewish emancipation, what to do with the Jews in Europe, um, is, is uh, framed in, in terms of colonial expansion. Despite the fact that the, the Germans themselves are not really engaging in a whole lot of colonial expansion, other European powers were, um, and that that, that furnished, furnished a kind of, you know, d discursive template for thinking about the Jews. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's a reasonably convincing argument. Um, you know, you, you, you could point um, to, to a variety of other ways in other parts of Europe in which, you know, Europeans, when encountered with the otherness of, of uh, imperial subalterns, drew on the you know paradigmatic example of otherness that they that they, they had experienced, which is that of the that of the Jews, and so you know this uh, it's probably not a coincidence uh, 
um, that the Abbé Grégoire, who's a sort of major figure in the emancipation of, of French Jewry, starts off writing about Jews and then ends up spending a lot of time writing about the emancipation of, of the yeah, colonized. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a fairly convincing genealogy there. That, uh, some of the linkages sort of remain to be worked I mean, out. It's, because it seems like in a very basic way, I mean, the, you know, in the 19th century, you know, Jews throughout Europe are told that their language is bad, that their customs are bad. The whole discourse of regeneration is not that different from the discourse of colon, you know, uh, applied to colonized people. Yeah, I mean, you right. could make the argument that, I mean, that uh, the civilizing mission is born in part at the, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, in the the kinds of conversations that go on around the but at the same time as, as your project is showing the uh, you know at the same time the French are feeling themselves colonized by predatory Jews so it's a, exactly yeah and I mean I I think it's perfectly legitimate to argue that that Jews furnish a kind of conceptual template for for uh, later on categorizing colonial others, colonized others, and so that it makes sense to talk about what happened to the Jews in terms of material colonization. There's a, there's a sort of, I think there's a, an analogous kind of phenomenon going on there, and I, I don't mean to, to, to dispute that. I think it's, it's fairly convincing, but it's not always that interesting because uh, what, it, what it often boils down to is that Europeans uh, had a, a slot in their brains for thinking about, right. you know, uh, ra a racialized other. And that the ways in which Jews get were treated, you know, is sort of an analogous, or I should say, homologous, because there's sort of mm -hmm. really common origins in race thinking. Is, that's our its point. Um, uh, you know, it, that sort of uh, omits every other way in which the circumstances of empire, the fact of empire, produced all kinds of changes. Many of which were taken up by anti-Semites in ways that didn't have much to do with race at all. At least not of the colonized. Anti-Semites were, you know, were, 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 uh, sometimes in writing about the colonies would not even mention the fact that there were colonized Muslims at all in, in Algeria and Tunisia. They were more interested in, in what uh, uh, British Jews or French Jews were doing to maneuver in Africa to leave France out in the cold uh, versus the other colonial powers, for instance. So um, uh, what I'm trying to do is just kind of open up a space for those more sort of synchronic uh, contingent interrelations between these two major phenomena that are co-constructed, I, I think, um, in ways that go beyond just the, the, this, uh, uh, this uh, received notion of, of, of uh, related racializations. Um, since you mentioned Abbe Gaivoire, I just wanted to, uh, it's been occurring to me that Using the word empire, France had two moments of empire, and there was the first empire, which was built on slavery, and that's what David Aguirre was uh, working to put an end to, and he's an absolutely uh, key, uh, key figure in this. And I just wanted to mention the fact that um, the Code Noir, the Slave Code of 1685, talks uh, about the, the Jews, right? The yeah. Article 1 said, uh, no, kicks the Jews out of the colonies. Um, now, how many people that affected in 1685? I've never seen any, uh, any, any figures of that. But I wonder, do, does Arendt touch on either the question of slavery or this first moment, if I can call it that, of empire, which is very different from what, every, everything that you've mentioned, which dates from the, the late 19th century, the scramble for Africa, 1885, and, uh, and, and so on. But I wonder if the specter, the shadow of slavery, comes in at, at, at all? Not really. Um, she's, she, she's more preoccupied with the, the, the second imperial moment, the high empire um, in the late 19th century, in part because it's there that she locates the kind of uh, bureaucratizing uh, apparatus um, that, according to her, would then rebound back onto the continent. Um, and, and so far, she go, she she uh, talks about uh, earlier race thinking. She's she's tending more to do intellectual history, and she's, she's interested in what Gobineau had to say earlier in the nineteenth century. But she doesn't she doesn't attend at all really uh, to to the the French um, uh, the first French Empire. She does spend some time talking about slavery in the South African context, and so her argument is that the enslavement of Black Africans by the Boers is productive of uh, a certain dehumanization 
uh, a certain kind of racism that she identifies with Nazi exterminationism. exterminationism. So she does spend some time talking about slavery, but not in the not in the French context. In part because for Arendt, the France is is the is the, the paragon of the nation state that she so reveres, and so France in some ways gets off kind of kind of easy <laughs> in, in, in the origins, in the way that the, the, the British don't. Um, she also doesn't associate this uh, in this uh, kind of gratuitous expansion for expansions shape with the French, kind of inexplicably. I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's you know pretty evident that that kind of uh, uh, gratuitous political will detached from any real economic necessity is very much operative in the French context, certainly as much uh, so as in the, the British context. But she, you know, France holds a special place in her heart, and I think that's one of the reasons that uh, that she tends to focus on the on the British example. But the point I wanted to make here is that these these kinds of discourses about Jews and empire at the end of the nineteenth century are made in very much the same ways in France and and uh, Britain by by anti Semites. And there's even there's even some some, uh, some there's some currents between them. One of the one of the popularizers of this kind of myth of the Jewish colonial conspirator is. Hilaire Belloc, so with who with G.K. Chesterton is one of kind of the famous sort of British uh, literary anti-Semites at the beginning of the of the 20th century, where he was half French and read Drummond's you know La Libre Parole in the Drummond's newspaper regularly. Um, was one of the few uh, uh, people in British who was convinced of Dreyfus's guilt, and so there's there's some, there's some currents there, but I mean it, it really doesn't matter because the argument is analysis uh, is, is analogous and I. You know, in many ways, Drummond invents it in the 1880s in France. Of course, <clears throat> what you describe is truly awful, and anti-Semitism in all its forms is, it is terrible. And uh, yet, it seems so much milder than what was inherited, say, from the Middle Ages, the, the deicide form of anti-Semitism, uh, which was, you know, was a gave a kind of almost metaphysical basis for the extermination of Jews. Uh, can you comment on the, what seems to me, the relative um, negotiability, mildness of this anti-Semitism as opposed to the, the anti-Semitism that might have been built into a Catholic theology? You know, if all men are my brothers, then the one who is not my brother is not a man. 